Uh, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel here. It is a one o'clock block on a given Tuesday. And um, we have uh, Michael Davis and uh, Victoria Wei, uh, both of whom are experts on Hong Kong. That's what we're going to talk about updating on the trouble in Hong Kong. Um, Michael is a uh, visiting professor at the University of Hong Kong. He's also with the Woodrow Wilson uh, Institute. And uh, finally, he's associated with Jindal University in India. Um, Victoria is an associate professor of political science in, um, in Notre Dame. Am I right? If I'm, if I'm not right, correct me, would you guys? Okay. All right. Um, there's much, much more, but we can't spend the whole show introducing you guys. So we're going to get right to the point. Um, so this trouble in Hong Kong, it hasn't gone away. Um, right thinking people all over the world are upset about it and believe that uh, Xi Jinping is being very aggressive and nasty unnecessarily without a good reason, but he does it. And nobody stops him. And I, one of the remarkable things is that uh, China now uh, uh, is on the uh, Human Rights Committee at the uh, at the United Nations. It's all backward, and but it keeps on going down the track, and it gets worse and worse. Uh, uh, Michael, am I am I being too pessimistic about this? Is there light at the end of this tunnel somehow? Uh, your pessimism is fully justified. Uh, I think. Uh, you know, it's interesting, the Chinese officials and the Hong Kong officials who put forth this new national security law in Hong Kong, which is really the sort of at the heart of, of the discussion right now, they, they put this uh, national security law, they promulgated it in Hong Kong on July 30th. And it essentially uh, locates Beijing officials in Hong Kong. It makes Hong Kong's top officials very subordinate to Beijing in these committees uh, a so-called committee to safeguard national security and another uh, a Beijing office in Hong Kong, uh, the office to safeguard national security. Uh, neither one of them are subject to judicial review. Uh, and uh, in fact, the Beijing office uh, literally could take a, a defendant across the border to the mainland to try them. So basically it makes mincemeat of the human rights guarantees that are in the basic law of Hong Kong, which is kind of a, you know, the international treaty that uh, the, the treaty, the joint declaration is the treaty, basic law is enacted under that. Uh, and it, it's about the commitments made to Hong Kong when Hong Kong was returned to China. And it seems like those are now all being cast aside. And the only hope if there is any, uh, presumably because the, the, these officials don't listen to Hong Kong people, I suppose would be if international supporters uh, impose cost on China for doing this because Hong Kong isn't just, you know, another foreign place. It's one of the major, you know, center cities of the world. It's the New York, the London and Hong Kong and Paris. We all know the list, Tokyo. There's just a few of these places in which all of us have some interest and all of us are aware of and it's part of our lives. And so Hong Kong people are on the front line of this, but whatever is being threatened here uh, threatens a lot of the world as well. And, and, and Beijing's indifference to international concerns is a, a big concern. Yeah, Victoria, you know, um, the people of Hong Kong are so vital. They're so energetic. Um, they're, they're, they're the Chinese un, unrestrained. Is that certain je ne sais quoi kind of um, Chinese experience in Hong Kong. And yes, I, I totally agree with Michael um, that Hong Kong is like New York. It's a, it's a world center of activity of business of all those good things and then now it's being injured uh, in its spirit I think with all these arrests um, we've had arrests of, and I mean the one that really sticks in my brain was the this uh, 12 year old girl who she moved by a policeman too quickly and he decided she was running away from him she was on to buying school supplies in a supply store and she was going to school and, and they wound up pinning her to the sidewalk. They tackled her. And this, and of course, you know, with cell phones, this picture got out, went viral. So can you talk about the arrests? I mean, it goes from newspaper publishers to people who were involved in the 2019 uh, demonstrations to this 12-year-old this girl. Yeah, Jay, so the situation is that I think everyone is calling Hong Kong now a police state. And as so you said that, you know, a 12 year old girl, she was just basically walking down the street buying supplies. She had nothing in her hands, just a cell phone. And then when the police stopped her, she was nervous and she began running. And then the police went after her. And so in the US, you know, what has really sparked a lot of protests is that you have police kneeling on protesters. 
and this is a daily occurrence in Hong Kong. And these police officers enjoy impunity. They actually know that, you know, there are all these live streaming uh, cameras all around them. They don't seem to care, which really means that, you know, they can do whatever they like and they would not suffer any, from any consequences. In fact, there have been actually officers who, who fired at protesters and they got promoted and they became hero uh, in, in, uh, uh, in Beijing's eyes. And so it's a very sad situation. How bad this is going to go, kind of relating to the question you were asking, Mike, uh, the sad thing is that uh, many people would be say will say, well, you know, don't worry too much about it. If Hong Kong just becomes a Chinese city, you know, Beijing takes over Hong Kong and look at Shenzhen across the border is a tech hub. And look at Shanghai is a financial center. The problem is that in these places, most of the managers are happy with the regime. You have only the minority who, who wants to protest about, you know, because their actual interests are hurt. You have workers who don't get paid. You have peasants with lands taken from them and they're not compensated. But these are, are not really the majority. And the, the governments can, can control a lot of these people. And most of the elite supports the regime. In Hong Kong, you have the majority who wants to resist Beijing's encroachment. They used to be able to protest. And now any kind of protest is, is, has been rendered unlawful. And how do you silence the majority? It is very, it's very scary thoughts that now people have this thing to, yes, maybe, you know, last year people were saying today's Xinjiang or today's Tibet, tomorrow's Hong Kong. It seems that Hong Kong is descending to that. But as you said, Hong Kong people are very, very resilient. So uh, you said earlier that you know, the Apple Daily's publisher, Jimmy Lai, was arrested. And then people were like, okay, we are just going to run out to buy all the copies of the, the Apple Daily the next day. So people <laughs> stood in line. They normally would print only 75,000 copies a day, but that day they, they printed 550,000. They were all sold out. People were also buying up stocks. And also that there are people get, gathering together to, to put ads. I'm actually one of those now that oversees Hong Kong, Amer Hong Kong, uh, Overseas Hong Kong academics putting together an, an ad. And so there are a lot of these efforts. And so it's really sad, but they hope that Hong Kong will not descend into like Tibet and Xinjiang is Hong Kong people's resilience. The world will continue to fight. Hope so. But, uh, you know, like uh, it seems to be getting worse. The number of arrests are in the thousands. And uh, one thing uh, you mentioned or, uh, that made me think of it is that you can post a little, a little post it. Okay, with nothing on it, blank posted. It's a statement, of course, that there's nothing on it. Or you can post a sign or carry a sign with nothing on it at all. And it's a statement. And the police come after you for that, for the blank sign. <clears throat> so, you know, this is, it seems to be getting worse. And my question to you is how you say that they have, you know, resist resilience, uh, that the people are mm, so so devoted to independence uh, and uh, to uh, democracy and free speech. How long can they continue to do this when it gets worse all the time? As you're quite right, but let me just um, have a full notice that most Hong Kong people are not for independence. Most Hong Kong people just really want Beijing to honor the one country, two system promises to continue today so that they can continue to enjoy the freedoms and also to have the democracy promised by the basic law. And so you're quite right. What happened, why people were put, putting up these blank posts and blank pieces of paper was because we don't really know what words are going to be banned on July 1st, people held up liberate Hong Kong revolution of our time. And it turns out that that protest slogan was banned. So we, because we don't know. And so the people put, put up all the blank sheets of paper. And then the police said, but you guys, then also, you guys are uh, liable to this uh, unlawful assembly because you don't have a police commission. And then, um, not only that they took down post, post it notes with messages, but they put up Mao messages, Chairman Mao's messages to rebel his righteous. And, and, and then uh, they basically, so how can you take down Mao messages? Right. So, but it's a statement within a statement. <laughs> you know, it's what it is. Yeah, it's making even, a statement. They're so, even using slogans from, from the Chinese constitution. <laughs> to as a protest slogan and say, okay, is it illegal to quote the Chinese constitution? <laughs> <laughs> we know what they're really saying. But, you know, the, the remarkable thing is that, um, that this is it's getting worse. And my, my question to you, Michael, is why? Um, does, does, does it have to be this way? 
Xi Jinping is, seems to be going into space on this kind of thing. It's just getting worse and worse. And the international community is not standing up. There's no, there's no pushback from any, mm, any state leader, any national leader saying, wait. And, and we know, don't we, that he would respond if there were that, but there isn't that. Nobody is telling him to stop. So he just sees all of this, including COVID, as an opportunity to be more and more repressive mostly with Hong Kong. What's wrong yeah, with they, him? Yeah, they, well, he's, he's a dictator. But the, you know, the bottom line is there are pushbacks. I mean, the US uh, passed the Human Rights and Democracy Act and the, the president uh, declared that Hong Kong, uh, well, the Secretary of State declared that Hong Kong was no longer autonomous and China was not keeping its commitments and therefore the United States no longer treats Hong Kong uh, as a, in a special way that it did before. And at the same time, they've designated certain officials in Hong Kong that uh, you know their bank accounts and ever, all sorts of things could be sanctioned. So there's some pushback. The UK has announced that the BNO passport holders, which potentially is about you know half the population of Hong Kong, if you include their families, uh, could have a right of abode in Britain. So there are these various kinds of, of pushbacks. But I think th there's a sort of powerlessness as well. I mean, at the end of the day, what do you do to China? I mean, uh, you can't, you're not going to send in an army uh, to do this. It's just would, would be counterproductive. You cause more damage than you would uh, uh, benefit to the people. So, so you're basically using pressure and, and imposing cost. But the problem is, is we're getting reports now that Chinese economy is bouncing back because it's uh, not, uh, the COVID problem is less serious there than it is in some countries. Uh, and so they're exporting all these things. Uh, uh, and so at the end of the day, it's, it's not really clear what you can do except stand for your principles. And I think some in Hong Kong want to do that, but the price of doing it there on the front line is very high. Uh, for governments to do it, uh, to sanction China, to cut off uh, this or that kind of trade <clears throat> also comes uh, with a cost, but not the, the severe cost that we have in Hong Kong. And I don't think that in the world at large, we've really come together to understand any effective way to pressure governments that don't want to behave themselves. So it becomes kind of a multi-targeted uh, process where you do this and that and, and see if any of that uh, encourages improved behavior. Well, you know, in, in years past, I think people look to the United Nations to do that sort of thing, a multilateral reaction to things that were offensive, you know, violations of human rights and the like. But the United Nations has been neutralized and China sits on the human rights. Uh, it's, the, it's the chair of the Human Rights Commission at the United Nations. And, and Trump has abandoned the United Nations. And, and so the United Nations isn't saying anything. Um, wouldn't it be better if the United Nations could do something? Yeah, there, there were some sort of people, you know, what it happens, and I've heard, I talk to, I teach human rights, so I talk to people in Geneva and elsewhere. And in these, uh, you know, the office uh, in, in, the, in the UN, China has a lot of influence just among the bureaucracy. You know, it pushes people around and puts pressure on them. And so a lot of things can't, can't be done. But these uh, special reporters the other day wrote a letter uh, condemning China. I think there were seven or eight of them. And that this is a, a joint letter from them. And these are people who are not working for the UN, but they are kind of in a volunteer basis, a special reporter for free speech and this and that and the other thing. And they pointed out at great length why the national security law violates China's commitments uh, to international human rights. So, so they're, they're, like you said, these things, uh, you, know, you know, I begin to teach my next semester of human rights classes tomorrow. And you tell students basically, it's about naming and shaming mostly. It's about publicizing what people are doing. And so these are things that we all can do. That's what we're doing here right now. We're trying to publicize and draw attention to, to these problems. And sometimes that's, that's the, the, the most effective tool you have. And, and I think getting the word out, I've just written a book on the subject. So getting the word out in any way we can I think is, is, is kind of what we're, we're doing right now. Can we digress about the book? Here's, here's the cover of the book. I wanted you to just say what it is. 
Oh yeah, well, it's a book that really looks at how China has, it's not new what China's doing now, that it, over ever since 1997, when ha Hong Kong was handed over, they've been chipping away at the promises that were made at the autonomy and basically using all this behind the scenes initially and now openly manipulating the government and putting pressure on the government. Just this week, uh, the chief executive of Hong Kong came, came out and declared that Hong Kong has no separation of powers. Now you're an American, so you know separation of powers is the heart of how you protect human rights in a country, checks and balances and all of that. We used to, we used to have that, Michael. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and now we got a right wing court. But in any case, there you have it. And, and so she's saying it, but then she goes on and says, we, the, the different branches of our government are separate and we have checks and balances. So I, you say to yourself, well, isn't that separation of powers? So why is she saying there is no separation of powers? She's saying it because Beijing is saying it. And why is Beijing saying it? Because they think the, the people of Hong Kong, professors like myself and lawyers, are using separation of powers to constrain what Beijing can do in Hong Kong. And we're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, long ago in a white paper, they said that we had a confused uh, view of what the basic law is. Yet even the Chief Justice of Hong Kong says we have separation of powers. Where so, do I get the book? Can I get the book on Amazon? Uh, we're going to, it's, it's, in, it's coming out in October. So when it comes out, I'll send you uh, a, a, a link to, to get it. Yes. Okay. So Victoria, I, I want, you know, this seems to me to be a pattern that worth, worth connecting. <clears throat> just um, just um, today in the press, there was a, a story of more trouble at the Galwan Pass uh, 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 in the Himalayas, uh, where the, the Chinese uh, brought thousands of troops there with planes and tanks and what have you. They're ready to fight the Indians yet again. In the past, they've been, uh, there's been a sort of an unspoken agreement not to, maybe it was spoken, uh, not to use guns, not to use weapons, but now there are weapons and this changes everything about the Himalayas. So they're being more aggressive with India. India doesn't like it. There are protests already in India about this. And then, you know, there was another piece a couple of days ago about Mongolia. They're pushing in Mongolia. They're trying to destroy Mongolian culture, religion, language, and what have you. Um, is this necessary? Does this help China in some way? Why is China doing this really pretty much all at the same time? Look at South China Sea, look at the moves on Taiwan, all these things. It's like they're into uh, manifest destiny um, all over the world. What is going on? Yeah, I think the last time we were talking to you that I were talking about Xi Jinping, he wants to become the most uh, accomplished emperor throughout Chinese history, really reigning in every single piece of border. And this is why we're seeing all these aggressive moves all around China's periphery. But at the same time, it is great that you brought up, you know, India and, and all the ends of South China Sea. Because for so long, people would say that whatever Beijing does in Hong Kong, because this is, you know, it's exercising sovereignty. And so all these internal matters really do not tell us how aggressive or how peaceful Chinese is, is in its international relations. But we can see that what Beijing has been doing in Hong Kong has implications for the rest of the world and across all border disputes. And they all happening at the same time. Now, this also goes back to what you said earlier about, you know, why had, what about pushback? And in fact, there's been pushback. And I would say that for 20 some years, that every single year that Western governments would want to look the other way about whatever was happening in Hong Kong. But with the national security law, no one can look the other way. And you have this, you, Hong Kong is so obviously descending into a police state. But what happens, it seems, is that Xi Jinping is willing to pay very high prices to reign in Hong Kong. Because while Hong Kong people think that we are just trying to fight for freedom, just trying to preserve, you know, whatever we, we were promised, in Xi Jinping's eyes, Hong Kong presents a challenge to the regime, to ch challenge to is his own authority. And it is just like why in 1989 that Beijing rolled out the tanks, the tanks uh, on the streets to, to massacre students because they, they felt that we either do this or the regime is going to collapse. And this is, I think, how we should look at it. But the backlash is happening. And, but they seem to be, you know, we'll rein in uh, Hong Kong, we'll rein in all the border conflicts, and then our economy is doing better than everyone else. And so we're going to make it. Yeah. And, and I mean, just a footnote to all of that, if 
he um, succeeds in a uh, coronavirus vaccine, he will look pretty good to the world. And, and my understanding is that he is now in trials on, on the Chinese um, candidate for coronavirus vaccine. Um, and so, you know, that'll look better. I mean, I think there's so much of this is propaganda. He wants to look good for the people. So for example, Michael, if, if um, he pulled back from Hong Kong, if uh, all of a sudden he developed a little religion here and, and, and stopped doing this, uh, <laughs> I won't say what kind of religion that might be, um, yeah. then the people in China would see him, what, as weak. Mm -hmm. So he's committed. He can't pull back. Am I right? Yeah, I remember years ago when the, we were having other protests in Hong Kong, in, I think it was 1989, and uh, Lee Kuan Yew came up from Singapore and he wagged his finger at Hong Kong people. He says, you cannot mock a Chinese leader. And what he meant wasn't that they couldn't because they were, but that a Chinese leader cannot tolerate you to mock him. He cannot appear weak. He cannot ex allow that kind of confrontation, which is everyday politics in democracies. Uh, and it's, the answer is simple, it's not a democracy. If you're an authoritarian dictator and you're on the top of the heap, then you better be prepared to fight to stay there. And that's an unfortunate reality. Sometimes he can be kind of brought to the table and persuaded to take softer tactics. But as Victoria said, when he thinks his, his position is threatened, uh, he, he will get uh, very uh, tough. Uh, you know, what I'm, I'm thinking is that if he takes a position was very aggressive with Hong Kong and other places, and then in somewhere in the middle, for reasons that are not clear, he backs off that position, then he's then he loses his authority at home, and they see what's wrong with this guy. You know, he's weak now. He was strong, and we had to give him respect for that, even though it may not be deserved on a you know human rights basis. But now he's soft. He's softer, and so he loses power at home. Is that? Do you think he sees it that way? Therefore, if he's on the track, if he's committed to, you know, uh, the national security law approach, making um, Hong Kong a police state, uh, he can't he can't turn around, he can't do it. Am I right? I think you're quite right about this in, in, a, in a way. Every regime has to claim some kind of legitimacy. They cannot get it from democracy. They, then they're trying to get it from nationalism. And they also cannot get it from communism because the CCP is actually states you have a lot of mainlanders all denouncing Hong Kong, and therefore, um, he really cannot back down. But what is also interesting is that there are actually a lot of talks about how the international backlash that Xi Jinping has generated is also causing him a lot of troubles among the top elites. So we will see how this goes, but ultimately, it's the economy that matters. If he can keep the economy going, maybe he can survive. Yeah, and, and if he has a vaccine, that makes it even better. I mean, he's taking he's taking uh, credit um, for the economy. He's, he's going to the world and saying, look how good we are. We had a problem. We fixed it. And now if he does the vaccine as well, he'll be a real hero. Uh, but let me ask you this, though. This is this is a hard question. Um, we have we're in the middle of this hmm, extraordinary presidential campaign uh, where the future of the country really depends on on what happens. And it's not only who votes for whom. It's more like how much damage Trump can do to the voting infrastructure and the suppression of voting to, to skew the result. Uh, it's really, uh, it's just better than any reality show I ever saw. Nobody knows the answer. Nobody knows what's gonna happen in five minutes. But my question is, what do you think the differential is, Victoria, from a political science point of view, vis-a-vis um, -vis Hong Kong, and for that matter, China in general, if uh, if Trump wins or Biden wins, how do you see the um, the two possibilities unfolding? Yeah, so I think that there's one thing that's very important to keep in mind is that for both a lot of Americans as well on the left in particular, and also Hong Kongers, Hong Kong Americans, they see this Chinese Communist Party as being on the left wing, and so when they want to find an ally. Then they want to say that then they want to go to the, the other side. So we see actually a lot of Hong Kongers saying that they, you know, Trump save us and all that. Um, but at the same time, the Hong Kong cause has to be really bipartisan. It was really bipartisan support that got the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act passed. At the same time, just the, uh, just the administration, just the US government, 
in imposing sanctions, that's not enough. You need all these other Western allies joining forces. But there's another thing that's also interesting when we were talking about separation of powers earlier is that in the US, you have appointment power. Basically, the US president and the Hong Kong chief executive both have very immense appointment powers. The difference is that the chief executive of Hong Kong is not elected, whereas the US president is. And this is something that people should really pay attention to exercise the vote. Um, you know, Michael, I, I wonder, you know, the part of that national security law is you don't have to be in Hong Kong to violate it. You can be somewhere else. That's and right. I don't know if they've tested that yet, but they may, you know, some somebody in some other country makes some statement that that, uh, that, that Beijing feels is a violation of that law. And then later on, that person winds up in either China or Hong Kong and they arrest them. Um, very troublesome. But my question to you is, is this affecting the way Chinese people or Hong Kongers who are outside of Hong Kong, outside of China, talk about it? Is this suppressing free discussion outside of China as well? Well, it, it does. Obviously, if people think that they're going to be coming and going to China, a lot of people outside who are of Chinese origin might have business uh, arrangements that involve them traveling to the country. And uh, I think there's no doubt, even professors, it doesn't have to be businessmen. It can be any kind of person who, who goes to China. Uh, then I think they're going to be cautious that they don't, they don't want to be seen uh, too aggressively uh, criticizing China or uh, attacking the regime. So, so no doubt it will have that impact there. Of course, there are other people and other night in the streets of New York, a protest was going on over this, who, who are very determined, uh, even more determined in the face of these developments to, to uh, stand up to China and to, to uh, bring you know, uh, other people to the table to understand what's going on. So it cuts both ways, but no question. Uh, there have been surveys of universities, so universities around the United States uh, where people teach courses on China are having conversations about how to do this without getting their students in trouble and so on. And China has put out warrants for arrest for Americans. Uh, Samuel Chu, who's at the Hong Kong Democracy Council, has a warrant for his arrest. He's an American citizen because he uh, petitioned his own government, the United States government, uh, to pass the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act and other acts and so on. Uh, and that he, you know, he's a lobbyist, he's an activist, uh, he's, there's an arrest warrant for him. So, so uh, these concerns that people have are real and, and the law re does reach worldwide. Mm. Uh, Victoria, last question. Um, we're not talking to countries now, we're not talking to heads of state, we're not talking to United Nations officials, we're talking to just our viewers, wherever they are. Some of them are here in the United States, uh, others are in Asia, ordinary viewers. What, what would you say to them about how to look at all this, how to see it in terms of what, what they might think about it, and maybe, maybe more to the point, what they might do about it to express the, the moral view here? It is it, it basically the dying of the killing of a city, of, of, of a people that really wants to defend their freedom. And so the rest of the world, the more attention they pay to Hong Kong, the, then the better off Hong Kong people become. And also lobby your own government, whatever that is, to protect Hong Kong, to also continue to decertify autonomy, impose sanctions on officials and at the same time provide asylum and refugee status to those who manage to, who wants to flee and manage to flee. Yes. Michael, would you add anything finally to that? No, I think, I think that's exactly right. You, you mostly people have to reach out to their own governments. Uh, and, and at, at the end of the day, as we discussed earlier is if there's enough cost in bullying people, whether it's Indians or Hong Kongers and, or Tibetans, then, uh, perhaps you can discourage that and, and bring about change. You know, frankly, if Beijing just carried out its commitments under the basic law, Hong Kong would not be protesting. It, it, I, I quite frankly, I don't think protesters would be able to mobilize people if these commitments for democratic reform and, and uh, the essential non-interference in Hong Kong were carried out, its autonomy were, was maintained. I, I think we wouldn't be seeing any of this. 
Okay, well, we're about done. I just I just wanted to tell you, uh, per our discussion earlier, that I do not intend to watch the movie Mulan, the Disney movie Mulan, uh, and and it's not because it costs thirty dollars to thirty dollars thirty American dollars uh, to get it on on cable. Uh, it's because Joshua Wan, a, a primary outspoken protester, recommends that we all boycott the movie because the movie was made in Xinjiang, and I'm good for that. Not only the $30, but that. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you very much, Thank Michael. You. Great to have you guys on the show. There'll be so much more about Hong Kong, I'm sad to say. And we'll, and we'll be back to you to cover it some more. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Aloha.